Okay, sequencing technologies. Um, so, of course, uh, most important part of, uh, or uh, most important part of the introduction of this course is what the actual uh, different sequencing technologies related to next generation sequencing actually are. Um, so if you think about next generation sequencing, you also often think about the applications, obviously. So um, I think most, like maybe 90, 95% of the applications can be uh, sorted in five or six different topics. One of them is, for example, uh, transcriptome characterization, where you actually sequence uh, transcripts, so the genes that are expressed in, in a tissue. Another application is epigenome uh, characterization, for example, ATEC-seq or uh, bisulfite uh, sequencing. Uh, another one can be DNA protein interactions, for example, um, ChIP-seq. Uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, for example, if you want to do an assembly, uh, very relevant for bacterial genomes, but also for, for more and more eukaryotes or more and more eukaryotes. You have an assembled genome nowadays just because sequencing has become cheaper and you also now have the computational infrastructure uh, to do it. Another application can be variant de detection. For example, if you are interested in the relation between uh, absence or presence of specific variants and specific and the relation between phenotypes, for example, disease resistance. Uh, metagenome characterization can be uh, related to whole genome assembly, depending a little bit on, on the application, of course. Um, maybe you can think of, of other applications. Also, I have a hard time thinking of really other applications. So that's why uh, I'm asking you. If not, then I continue to the next slide. So a uh, typical experiment in one of those applications usually starts with the experiment design. You uh, get your samples ready, you extract your DNA or your RNA, um, depending um, um, uh, depending on your uh, starting material and, and your type of application, you do a specific library preparation, and then you have the, the sequencing. And after the sequencing has uh, started, then the bioinformatic analysis starts. So after you have the sequencing read, then the bioinformatic analysis starts. So usually what you do first uh, in the analysis is some quality control just to see uh, on the FASTQ file. So the read you have, whether you get the quality you expected. One very important quality measure is, for example, the base quality of the reads. And that is a certain quality measure for how sure the sequencer was that the base, for example, you have sequenced an A or an T, whether that was actually that sequence. We'll go into that later on. After that, you have done, so you have done the quality control on the sequencing reads, then the alignment uh, starts. Uh, very often um, people have a reference genome um, and then the, the reads you actually generate, you align them to that reference genome, depending of course, a little bit on the application. So if you are interested in assembly, then you cannot do an alignment yet, of course, first want to do the assembly. Uh, then depending very much on the application, you do all kinds of downstream analyses. For example, if you uh, look at an RNA-seq data set, you're going to count the number of alignments per gene, and that can be a proxy for the expression of that gene. And that can then, of course, answer certain biological questions. So that particular part of the downstream analysis will uh, not be part of this course, at least uh, not primarily, because it is so different between all the different uh, applications for next generation sequencing. After, during, um, after and during the analysis, you always want to do some visualization. Um, in this context, with visualization, I mean based on tracks in the genome, meaning that you have a certain 
part of the genome that you're interested in. And you're going to look there, for example, at the alignment or the, the variance that you, you, that you have called in a particular region. So in, in this context with visualization, I mean really looking at a track in the genome, at a part of the genome, and see what kind of features are there. And of course, the visualization doesn't have to be necessarily after the downstream analysis. You also very often use it as a quality control, for example, after the alignment. In order to generate the, those sequences, there are many, um, many ways to, to do that. And these uh, different uh, methods, they have definitely evolved uh, during time. So this is an image from 2016. So that's already six years old. So it is uh, in uh, the world of next generation sequencing already pretty ancient, but I think it nicely depicts uh the the if uh, the the evolution of these different uh, methods so what you see on top left in green is the abi uh, sequencers um they have been discontinued uh most likely or i'm pretty sure it's mainly because illumina was too strong of a competitor it was very similar to illumina but just i think it was slower and just more expensive compared to Illumina sequencing. So the Illumina sequencers you see in, in brown, where um, during time, I should, by the way, also explain the graph. So in the graph on the x-axis, you see the read length in a log scale, and on the y-axis, you see the throughput in a log scale. So really um, meaning that if you go, uh, a little bit forward, you go already 10 times as much as high uh, in, in throughput, for example. So um, what you see is that, for example, the Illumina sequencers, they evolved from really relatively low throughputs, very similar to ABI, to longer and longer read lengths and also higher and higher throughput. And after that, you see that there is some kind of divergence with low throughput machines and higher throughput machines. And that is can be important for, for scalability. We'll go into that later on. Um, the blue one are the ion torrent machines. Maybe some of you have, have one of those in the lab because they are usually relatively small and relatively easy to operate. So you can have an ion torrent machine in the wet lab to, um, uh, and it, they, they generate a reads of maximum about 400 base pairs. Um, and relatively low throughput, but uh, high enough for many different applications. Then we have the 454 sequencers in orange, not used very often anymore. And then we see here on the bottom right, we see the Sanger sequencing. So that's not next generation sequencing, that's first generation sequencing um, with really pretty high read length, as you can see. Uh, higher than most of the modern second generation sequencers, uh, but very low throughput. Um, on the right hand, on the top right, we see the long read sequencers, uh, of course, on the on the very right of the of the image, uh, with Tech Bio and Oxford Nanopore technology, especially. Uh, so, I'm going to meet you, Sergeant. Okay. Uh, there we go. Yes. Okay. So uh, on the right, Spec Bio and Oxford Nanopore technology uh, sequencers, and they have evolved very much in the last six years. Also, Illumina, by the way. So uh, with the Promethean, uh, Oxford Nanopore technology really made a huge step uh, in throughput. And also a little bit in read length, but mainly in throughput. And nowadays is the most uh, the machine with the highest throughput of all sequencers. Um, then we have the Pack Bio SQL 2, which very much increased in both read length and, and throughput. Um, so also making it more competitive to the second generation sequencers. Um, and a uh, disadvantage of these long read sequencers is by default, they have a relatively low base quality, which means that they have a relatively high 
error rate, which means that it made quite a lot of mistakes during sequencing. Both the case for PacBio and Oxford Nanopore technology. However, um, uh, error rate uh, decreases more and more when these uh, technologies evolve. And PacBio actually has a pretty smart solution to that because what they do is they sequence the same molecule multiple times. And because these errors, they are random, if you make consensus out of that molecule, you actually get a higher base quality compared to, for example, the best Illumina reads. And that is very interesting, of course, because then you get both long reads that have a very high base quality and still with a pretty high throughput. So that's the hi-fi reads from PacBio. So during this course, uh, we will not talk about Sanger sequencing, at least uh, a lot, not so much about the technology. We will mainly focus on second generation sequencing. So you can, uh, they, they, nowadays, uh, the most frequently used methods for second generation sequencing are the iron torrent from Thermo Fisher and the Illumina sequencing uh, machines. And then third generation sequencing. So they are usually also called the long read sequencing the sequencers uh, from PacBio, Pacific Biosciences, and Oxford Nanopore technology. I have a question for you. I'm going to stop share and share my browser. There we go. So my question for you is, although Sanger sequencing has been around since the seventies, so for a very long time already, it's still used by quite a lot of labs. And why do you think that is? So um, what most of you answered is because its output quality is still unchallenged. Um, I would actually disagree uh, because base quality in Sanger sequencing is definitely, definitely not higher compared to Illumina or iron current sequencing. Uh, so I disagree with that. Uh, second, after the second um, most given answer is because the per base sequence costs are always very low. That's also, <laughs> also actually also not true, or at least I would disagree with that. So if you uh, sequence uh, your sample, a, a bunch of samples on ANOVA 6000, 6, which is one of the most high throughput machines, or maybe a Promethean, actually not for a Promethean, then the cost per base quality per, per base are definitely much, much lower than if you would have a standard Sanger sequencing run. So I actually also disagree with that. So the correct answer uh, because is because it's very scalable. So um, if we go back to, to our graph, there we go. So what you can see is over here on the y-axis, the gigabases per run. So the Let's say nowadays the smallest um, iron torrent or Illumina sequencers, they generate about, let's say, seven to eight gigabases per run. And you have to generate these gigabases. And that, that's really a lot, right? Gigabases. So that's, uh, uh, I should say this correctly. I think this is. Uh, a million bases, am I right? I think it's a million bases. So you have to generate all these bases, which means that if you have, for example, if you are cloning, for example, and you're just interested in whether you have cloned what you actually want to clone, or if you have generated an amplicon and you want to know the sequence of that amplicon, then you actually only need, I don't know, 300 bases. That's it, or maybe a little bit more. Let's say you need uh, 2,000 bases, uh, and not more than that. So um, if you put that on a machine, uh, then still it would be very expensive to actually sequence that because you just generate a lot of the same. It has to generate this amount of reads. The thing you're sequencing, you always generate a very low amount of a low number of bases, so you can much better scale it. So if you have, if you're only interested in, in a few. Uh, Amplicons, for example, then it's still cheaper per base to use Sanger sequencing 
However, if you want to generate a lot of data, of course, per base is much cheaper to take the high throughput SQL search. Nowadays, uh, Oxford Nanopore technology is definitely competing uh, with sonar sequencing because with this min ion sequencers that, that have also relatively low throughput and are relatively um, um, relatively cheap to generate a library for, um, they are kind of competing with, with Sanger sequencing. But other than that, uh, Sanger sequencing is still unchallenged in terms of scalability, especially if you are only interested in sequencing uh, a few bases. Is that clear? So if you have any questions or remarks regarding that, please, uh, please raise your hand. No? Great. So uh, now we go a bit more in depth in the different uh, technologies. We will, uh, in these technologies, we again, we will focus mainly on Illumina sequencing, but I want to give you a rather broad overview of the different uh, sequencing technologies. So we'll start with ion torrent sequencing, uh, also a type of next generation sequencing. Sukanya has a question. Yes, so throughput, high or low, is completely independent of the amount of input so low input is completely independent of whether you're going to do a high throughput or low throughput sequencing. Uh, yes, in a way, yes. So um, what we consider as low throughput still has quite really a lot of bases in there that can be sequenced. Meaning, uh, so if you have, I don't know the exact numbers, but if you have only a few nanograms of DNA, for example, there's still really a lot of a lot of bases in there. It's just a challenge to be able to actually sequence those 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 bases. So what usually happens is those uh, machines still need relatively um, uh, a lot of input. So what happens is that for low input uh, library preparation is that there are quite a few PCR cycles before you actually start the sequencing. So that is not targeted PCR. So that you try to amplify the entire uh, library, meaning uh, an untargeted PCR, but still there are some PCR steps there that increases the, the, um, the input amount. But in principle, um, even very low throughput samples still contain really a lot of diversity in terms of RNA and DNA and a lot of different uh, nucleotides to sequence. Okay, so ion torrent sequencing. Um, Relatively, I think it's, it's about the same age as Illumina. Maybe it's a bit, bit older even um, because the technology is based on is, is I guess, relatively uh, simpler. Um, nice thing about iron torrent sequencing is that already from the beginning, you had relatively low throughput. You could also scale it, but let's say the initial uh, library preparation has relatively low throughput. I think a few million reads for library prep. Also, one nice thing is that it's a relatively small machine, so really benchtop, so it can fit in, in many wet labs, and that's also why it's uh, still quite popular. Um, what happens during IOTOR and sequencing, or what you start with, is, well, you do a library preparation. What library preparation exactly is, we will go more uh, deeper into when we discuss Illumina, but where you start with is, uh, you have uh, biotin that you can use to actually, um, 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 you have a biotin sequence that uh, you can use to um, uh, use to annul to a magnetic bead, which is makes it easier to pull out sequencers. There's an adapter, you have your DNA in there. So it's usually a random piece of DNA if you are looking for a whole genome or RNA sequencing can be a specific, a targeted sequence if you look, for example, at amplicon sequencing, and at the other hand, an other adapter. Um, use magnetic beat, beats to uh, pull out uh, those sequence, uh, sequences, and uh, use emulsion PCR in order to amplify uh, a single uh, fragment, which is all the same, in the same emulsion. And that same emulsion is loaded on a chip. So what you will get is uh, in this emulsion, you have 
uh, fragments that are PCR amplified, that are all the same. And those are on a chip. So within each pores, let's say, uh, wells on that chip, you have an emulsion containing exactly the same sequence. What happens then is that these, uh, this chip is flooded with, um, for example, only uh, Gs. And if a G is incorporated, you get a difference in pH in that specific well. And that difference in pH can be measured by very sensitive uh, equipment. Um, depending on the signal of the difference in pH, you can actually see whether how many Gs are incorporated, for example. Uh, so if there are multiple Gs incorporated, you get a stronger single, signal if, than if there is one G incorporated. It all happens one at a time. So let's say if you have, uh, uh, if you flood it with a G, G is incorporated, you get a signal, flood it with an A, but it cannot incorporate that A, then you do not get a signal. So you uh, always flood it with A, G, C, D. And then again, A, G, C, D. And based on the signal you get in one of the different nucleotides, you can uh, know what kind of nucleotide there is. So over here in the image, uh, you get um, two protons released if there are two Gs uh, incorporated. Then you get a graph like this. So you have uh, one G incorporated, uh, then uh, two Ts, then two As, two Cs, and then an A. So these are uh, depicting uh, the, the flooding of that uh, chip with the different nucleotides. Um, so technically, or more, uh, if you look at the output of ion torrent sequencing, uh, it's pretty interesting. So you can go up to 400 base pairs of read length, which is longer than most Illumina sequencers. Um, it is quite scalable. So you can go to relatively low throughput at uh, not too high cost. And you can also go to relatively higher throughput, not comparable to the huge Illumina or uh, of nanoparticle technology machines, but still it's quite scalable. Um, however, Illumina also started producing relatively low input machines. So there's definitely some competition going on there. Uh, a big, an, an essential disadvantage of uh, ion torrent sequencing is that it has difficulties with sequencing homopolymers. So if you have, for example, five Ts in a row, it finds it very difficult to differentiate between, for example, five Ts or six Ts. And that's because of this signal that has to be translated into a number. So you often very, uh, very often, if you look at ion torrent data and you have a homopolymer in your sequence and those homopolymers, they occur very frequently, you uh, also always see a lot of insertions, deletions, which are actually sequencing errors. Siba has a question. Yes, my question is about the the use of the the bead. So, uh, is it yeah. is it just being used to um, to fish out kind of the the sequences, but does it also have a role in where it places now these on the pH sensitive chip and why exactly do yeah. I see? Yeah. Good question. Good question. Um, so I'm pretty sure I would have to check to be honest. So it's been a very long time since I've used this, uh, this machine. So I'm, I can look it up for you. I'm pretty sure this magnetic bead only captures a signal fragment. Okay. And that signal fragment is then uh, used for PCR and mm -hmm. that is then loaded on the chip. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I will, I will have a look to, to be entirely sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So that was ion torrent sequencing, then Illumina sequencing. Illumina sequencing is the most frequently used uh, method for uh, generating sequencing data nowadays. Uh, although, of course, the third generation sequencers are gaining popularity, but still it's the most a popular one, I would say. Um, it has really high throughput. Uh, the Nova Sec Tech 
6,000 can generate about 500 billion bases uh, per run, which is really massive. And they just introduced a even uh, higher throughput machine, forgot the name, and I, the throughput I can also look up, but it's even increased. Um, so most use platform today, definitely. So how does it work? What kind of data do you get out of it? Uh, so typically you generate reads between 50 and 300 base pairs in length. So relatively short, shorter than ion torrents, shorter than Sanger sequencing. So therefore, Illumina sequencing is also often referred to as short read sequencing. A nice thing about Illumina sequencing is that you can sequence paired end, which means that from the same fragment, so the same DNA fragment, you can sequence it on both sides. You do not know how far those two sequences are from each other, but you do know that they come from the same fragment. So they would be, if you align them back to the genome, they have to be relatively close to each other. Um, and that already helps with a lot of different questions. Uh, Pamsi. Yeah, that means the size of a fragment should not be more than 600 base pairs, right? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, so um, if you want to sequence the entire fragment, yes. But mm -hmm. what people often do is they uh, sequence longer fragments mm -hmm. and um, they know there is, so you know you often the average fragment size before you do the sequencing. And there you kind of know what kind of average length fragment that would be in between the two reads. And that can already be valuable information. So uh, just to compare it to single end sequencing, then you only always sequence 150, 300 base pairs. And you have no idea of, of sequences that are in the neighborhood of that, of that sequence. If you sequence paired end, then you know that two sequences, they are paired. They should be relatively close to each other, but you do not know the exact distance between them. But that is uh, already much more information than no information. Okay, but, but why companies ask for 150 to 1,000 or 800 base pairs, like when we are sending sequence things? For mm -hmm. a company, they ask for uh, optimal length should be 150 to 800 something. Of the fragment size, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it depends a little bit on, on the question you have. Okay. So, um, if you are, for example, interested in, uh, so if you, let's say if you use RNA sequencing and you're interested in, in splice variant, uh, what you actually want is usually a relatively large fragment size because then you can link axles to each other. So okay. then if, if, uh, if sequences are paired and one read aligns to an axon and one read aligns to another spliced out axon that can be spliced out or not, then you know that these two axons are from, the, or these two reads are from a specific transcript. Got it. For Got example. It. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's, of course, huge throughput. Uh, but what you often are not interested in is generate, for example, 500 billion base pairs of the same sample, of the same sample. Maybe if you have a huge genome um, and you want to do variant analysis in the genome, so you do whole genome sequencing, then you might be interested in generate 500 billion bases for that one sample. But usually what you try to do is to actually load multiple samples on the same sequencing machine. But you have to know where those reads actually came from. And we do that by barcoding. You'll go into that later on. But that's very uh, typical when this, this massive throughput sequencing started is that you have to be able to do multiplexing, meaning having be, being able to load multiple samples on the same sequencing uh, run. So how does an Illumina library operation look like? Please ignore the image on the top right. Uh, that shouldn't be there yet. So what you usually do is, let's say you have your DNA, um, so, or you have your cDNA, for example, you have reverse transcribed your, your RNA, and what you often First, do is you share it, share it, because uh, often those fragments they are too uh, long to be actually doing, for example, paired end sequencing with. So you first share your DNA. So you cut it up 
in, in smaller pieces. After that, also a little bit depending on your uh, application, you do a size selection and that's where you actually define this fragment size you want that you're interested in. Usually somewhere between, let's say 200, 200 and 800 base pairs, depending on your application. When you have done this size selection, uh, you ligate the adapters to the fragments of the right size. And these adapters, they are uh, typical, they are known sequences that are later on used to uh, do, for example, PCR and to add other sequences to uh, your fragments. For example, the barcodes. Uh, then uh, barcodes are added if you do multiplexing and most of the times you want to do multiplexing. So you want to uh, sequence multiple samples at the same time in the same run. And the P5 and P7 type are added. These P5 and P7 types, they are required to uh, anneal to the actual sequencing lane. So they are also known oligos that are typical for Illumina that are used to uh, be able to anneal to the sequencing lane. Very typical is uh, to do then a PCR, uh, depending, for example, on the amount of input you've had, usually between eight and 16 cycles of PCR. Usually what you do is you try to have uh, as little cycles as possible, uh, mainly uh, because um, PCR can uh, bias uh, the, the fragment distribution. There's a question from Daniela. Yes. Um, what is the difference between the barcode and the unique molecular identifier? This is always confusing. Okay, okay. Um, we will not go into that for this presentation, but I can explain it here. So the unique molecular identifier, uh, well, I should say both the barcode and the unique molecular identifier are added to the fragment before PCR. However, the unique molecular identifier is a completely random sequence. And um, because it's completely random, it only identifies the molecule, meaning the fragment. The barcode identifies the sample where the fragment actually came from. So you have a lot of different fragments with a, bar a barcode that is exactly the same, but you have, in principle, you kind of assume that, uh, let's say, yeah, for simplicity, you assume that all fragments have a unique uh, molecular identifier, a unique UMI. Later on, after you did do the PCR and you find the same fragment with the same UMI, you know that those two fragments originally came from the same original fragment. So they are PCR duplicates. But you uh, can also know this with the barcode, no? Come again? You can also know this with the barcode. No, because all the fragments that come from the same sample have exactly the same barcode. Ah, well. All the fragments coming from the same sample have a unique UMI. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay, then you do a PCR typically, and then you go on to the sequencing. So you, uh, with PCR, you generate enough uh, input uh, material uh, for, for the actual sequencing. For the sequencing, there is a nice movie of Illumina. It is the best movie I could find on the internet. So. Apologies for the commercial um, uh, commercial content, but it is what it is. So just to uh, give you a recap of the of the of the movie. So what happens is you get this bridge amplification, and that bridge amplification, what it does, it creates spots on the sequencing lane, and those spots they contain the sequence of the exact same fragment. So we've talked about the PCR steps over here. These are PCR steps for the library preparation that is done just in solution. Then you get a second PCR and that's that bridge amplification and that's the generate spot of sequences that are exactly the same 
uh, that have exactly the same fragment. And you need that bridge amplification to get this spot with, um, with reason of exactly the same fragment in it to get enough signal of the base incorporation. So those bases are incorporated at all at the same time at those uh, fragments that are exactly the same in that specific spot. So you get the sequencing primer, uh, base is incorporated, then depending on the base that is incorporated, you get a light signal. So a fluorescent signal is emitted. The fluorescent signal is picked up by um, basically a very sensitive camera and that fluorescent signal, the order of the fluorescent signals are translated into a sequence. So a single spot, so a group of bridge amplified uh, fragments, they generate the sequences of a single read. All right, some definitions. Well, because we have already heard the word fragment, we have heard uh, the word, uh, I think, exercise already. So this is how the library template looks before, before you start the sequencing. So you have this P5 and P7 that are used to a new to the sequencing lane. Then you have the uh, adapters that are used, for example, uh, for uh, PCR in general but also for uh, annealing of the sequencing primer. You have the barcode. Uh, sometimes you have dual indexing. So in the movie, they actually mentioned two barcodes. So you can also choose to have two barcodes, both on the five prime and the three prime end. You can also have one barcode. Can be enough definitely to um, have uh, multiple samples uh, sequenced in the same lane. And then you get your actual unknown fragment, right? And that is that is sequence. That's where you generate the reads from. So <clears throat> that black part, so that unknown sequence, that's what you call the fragment. Um, no, I'm sorry. So the black part, including the adapters, is usually called the fragment, but uh, sometimes people also call that black part the fragment or the insert size. So uh, it, it's used um, differently. So uh, depending on who you ask, the fragment would be, let's say, the unknown sequence. So the sequence coming from your organism plus the adapter sequences, or it is only the unknown sequence. But if you talk about insert size, that would be the unknown sequence that's inserted in between the adapter sequences, then you always talk about this unknown black part. And then you have a sequence called inner distance, and that is the part of the fragment that is not sequenced. There's a question from Pamsi. Uh, yes, so the read primer attaches near the adapter or near the barcode because we need the barcode information as well, right? Yeah, so actually what is done is the sequencing primer for the barcode is a different sequencing primer that is used for, for example, read 2. That is actually mm -hmm. the, the reverse complement of, uh, so the, the other, set, other uh, yeah, I guess you can call it reverse complement of the adapter, so in that sequence, it's the other way around. So Illumina yeah. does that to be sure that um, uh, really explicitly generate the barcode sequence. So the barcode sequence is not mixed with the actual fragment that you want to sequence. It's a completely different process of the sequencing. So the software in the machine will uh, align both the barcode and the read that was uh, like synthesized in the process or... Uh... How yeah, does so it the, work? like barcode work? Like barcode amplification works in this way, and the read goes in this way. So these two are two different amplifications, right? Or no? Two, Am I two different sequencing processes. Yeah, yeah. So how they are going to club together? Like it's a software um, because uh, they can't, would come from the same spot. So each spot has certain position on the sequencing yeah. lane. Yeah. And uh, the sequencer start with doing the actual sequencing of the fragment. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, for example, generates 150 base pairs. Yeah. Then it stops with that. It adds the sequencing primer for the barcodes. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So, and then the machine knows, okay, now I'm going to sequence the barcode. And then oh. you get the sequence generated. And then, you know, from that same spot, we have this read. Mm -hmm. And also we have the reverse read, so read two, and we have this barcode. Okay, that's mission how the, the three are associated. Come again? Mission do everything, like uh, attaching and everything. Yeah. That. Uh, yeah, so because those those that signal comes from exactly the same spot, so it, it has yeah. these three sequences and knows that they belong to each other. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Right. Michael has a question. If you give the number of reads from a sequence, you this read one and read two from a pair, then sequencing are counted as one read. Uh, Again, okay. sorry. So, in the data ana data analysis, you see these yep. read numbers, or, or sometimes they say spot numbers. How many reads you have in a uh, in the whole sequencing? Mm -hmm. So, and as I've seen it, I guess the so if it's a pair and sequence, these two pairs pairs count as one as one, one read. read. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's indeed, uh, uh, if you talk about definitions, that's also, uh, that's, a, that's also a good example. So if you talk about paired and sequencing, then you, let's say you want to, to generate 20 million reads, then you usually say, okay, I want to generate 20 million paired end reads, which means that you get two FASQ files, both with 20 million reads, so 20 million forward reads and 20 million reverse reads. So you usually do not say I'm going to generate 40 million reads, which are paired. That's that's usually what you don't say because they come from the same fragment and they come from the same spot. So but ideally you would say, okay, I generate 20 million reads from 20 million spots. Because then you know that they always belong to each other and you do that, for example, paired end. Okay. Does that answer your question? So basically, it's two reads counted as, as one. This read one and two. Yeah, yeah, depends on that's that's how you want would, would like to uh, define it, indeed. But so let's say if you generate twenty million paired and reads, in total you get forty million sequences. Okay. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Uh, Rodrigo has a question. Yeah, so I was just, just want to know the directionality. Uh, is it given by the P5 and P7, meaning that all pairings are directional? Or is it yeah. the adapter? So is the first one? Uh, definitely. Are... Okay. So uh, indeed, so the first, uh, I wouldn't know by heart, but I think uh, first the P5, um, from the P5 side, uh, the fragment is sequenced, which means that if you manage to make a library in such a way uh, that you always um, <clears throat> add a certain part, or uh, let's say if you always have, have uh, add a certain uh, mm, a certain side of the fragment to let's say the P5 side, then you indeed can. Uh, sequence directionally, and that's actually used very frequently in RNA sequencing, for example, where you do, for example, a uh, poly A capture and you design your library or you generate your library in such a way that, for example, always the B5 side is at the direction of the poly A, for example. I don't know the exact uh, which side is which side, but at least then you know. Um, <clears throat> um, if you are sequencing from, let's say, if you generate V1, on um, which strand of the RNA molecule it came from. And that can be very, very valuable information. For example, if you are aligning back your reads to your genome and you have, for example, overlapping open reading frames, then you can actually uh, assign reads to a specific transcript. And that can be for especially small genomes. I think, for example, Drosophila, that can be super valuable. And I'm pretty sure with Arabidopsis as well, in or at plant in general as well. Uh, Michael, you do not have a question anymore, I suppose, right? Great, thanks. Okay, question for you. Okay, we are 
talked about barcodes already quite a bit. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, you have now a pretty good idea what these barcodes are. So what is the purpose of barcodes for linear sequencing or indexes? They are basically synonyms. There we go. Very nice. And so with barcodes, indeed, it is possible to sequence multiple samples in one flow cell. So Illumina has some, oh, there's a question from David. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask if you at some point going to talk about like a direct comparison of the different sequencing technologies, like where is the strong suit, um, for example, handling like low quality DNA as an input, um, things like this, uh, where you could point at like for this purpose uh, or this application, most of the time, that's a little bit a better approach uh, rather than the other one. Mm. Not specifically what you mentioned, I think. So we will talk about, well, the, of course, the technologies and the, the general uh, advantages and disadvantages of the technologies. Yeah. Um, uh, it depends, well, again, it depends on the application very much about choices you make. Yeah. Um, so especially if you talk about, for example, library preparation, um, well, I hope with the, the knowledge of the different sequencing technologies, there, there, there are already some hints there uh, on, on specific problems, what you can do there. Um, yeah. If you have, so for example, uh, we just talked about this, this PCR, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before the library preparation. If you have low input, then you usually have to do a lot of PCR cycles, which can bias the, the, the distribution of the fragments. So some fragments get amplified um, more uh, preferentially than, than others. Um, so if you want, if your application requires a very um, not a bias between fragments, so a very nice distribution over your genome, for example, then a low input so having a lot of PCR cycles in there might actually uh, not be a good idea. So by explaining these concepts, um, there, there might be answers to your, to your questions. Of course, if there's anything in specific, uh, we can discuss that later on. You can ask it on Slack or, or channels like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so Illumina has some li limitations. It has relatively short reads. Um, but a very high throughput. So the maximum read, read length is about 300 base pairs, but usually the base quality, so the sequencing error by the end of those reads is already pretty high. So you, uh, you already make quite a lot of mistakes at the end of those reads. Um, and that, that gives some limitations, of course. So uh, we have been living in, let's say, an Illumina world for the, uh, for the past, uh, let's say, 10 years. Um, and there were always challenges, um, for example, on how to reconstruct repeats. For example, if you have, if you have 150 base pair Illumina reads and you have a repeat um, of, I don't know, 1KB long, you of course have no idea where that read actually should belong on that repeat. So that's very difficult. Uh, it gives a lot of challenges during, for example, uh, alignment. Um, same counts for isoforms. If you have isoforms between, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so different uh, isoforms of a gene, and you're interested in the differential expression of those isoforms, then Illumina is usually, uh, well, uh, gives you limited information because you uh, do not, cannot sequence the entire transcript, so you do not know what kind of isoforms are actually in your sample. Same counts for structural variation. So, for example, if you have very big insertions or deletions, also with short reads, they are very difficult to solve. Haplotypes, so if you're interested in which variants inherit together over a long stretch of sequence, then also uh, Illumina sequencing is very limited. Uh, same goes for genome assembly. So if you work with the bacterial genome and you compare, for example, <clears throat> uh, longer reads to short reads, then you probably already have seen that you can generate much nicer genomes with these longer reads, and just that's just because you have much more information on which, uh, how the, the genome of this organism actually looks like. And of course, definitely the same counts, or maybe even <clears throat> more counts for eukaryotes that have often very complex genomes with a lot of structural variation and repeats. 
So, Illumina, um, we have been paying you a lot of money uh, over the last, let's say, 15 or 20 years. Why can't you come up with a method that just generates longer reads? Well, the reason for that lies in the um, lies uh, in in the technology itself. So what you very often find when you look at, for example, quality control plots of Illumina reads is that you see by that by the end of the read, base quality declines, which means that there are more errors at the three prime end of a read. So when uh, the sequencing goes on and on and on, base quality goes becomes lower and lower and lower errors become more and more frequent. So at some point it becomes that bad that you have no idea what you're actually sequencing. It's just generating a random sequence, basically. This is typical for Illumina sequencing. And the reason for that is that you generate these spots. So these spots, they are generated by bridge amplification, as, as you have seen in the movie. So uh, what happens is you have the same fragment that is amplified by brace amplification. So all the sequences that are very close together, they have exactly the same sequence. They are amplified by PCR. And that is required to get enough signal for the base incorporation to be picked up by this, this camera. So if you would inc incorporate a base in a single sequence, you will never be able to pick it up. You need this bridge amplification in order to get enough signal. That would mean that incorporation of bases would happen, have to happen exactly at the same time for all of those fragments that are within a spot. And of course, because they are PCR product of each other, you expect that their sequences are all exactly the same. So for example, let's say your original fragment started with a C, then all of the bases get incorporated a C and you get a clear, in this case, a red signal. Then the next space is incorporated and you get a sequence signal for an A, for example, and so on and so on. However, this process of base incorporation is not flawless. So there are mistakes there. So for example, sometimes for one of the, of the fragments, a base is not incorporated for some reason. So it starts lagging behind. Or maybe two bases are incorporated. So it's uh, actually before the rest. And of course, if it lags behind over here, it's before a completely different base is likely to be incorporated over there. So you get a mixture of signal over there. So that is what you see over here on the, on the, on the bottom right. So that's an out of phase signal. And these errors, so these base incorporation errors, they build up towards the end of uh, the read. So the more you sequence, the more errors build up and the more mixed signal you get until it's so bad that this camera cannot figure out anymore whether the color it's, uh, it's measuring is actually red, yellow, or green. So, and then the base quality becomes very low, the error becomes very high because the base color is just not certain whether the base that it, it thinks it is is actually the base that was in your original fragment, yes or no. Um, so, and this uh, Illumina, of course, worked on that, try to improve that as much as possible. But at some point, because you have multiple fragments together, um, you always get, at some point, get this out of phase signal. So the technology is therefore always limited to shorter reads. So the third generation sequencers, they um, tried to solve this by maximizing the signal from a, a single molecule based readout, which means that you do not do this bridge amplification anymore. Now, what you try to do is to get a signal for, for example, base or incorporation of in into a single molecule, so not an amplified one, but a single molecule, and try to be able to actually measure that. So then you do not have this bridge amplification anymore. You do not rely on base incorporation on multiple fragments at the same time. No. You only look at the base incorporation or the signal from a sing single molecule. So therefore you do not get an out of phase signal. So if there's a mistake, of course, you see that mistake. Uh, so you, you, uh, you measure a mistake, but the base after does not, the base incorporation after that does, does not rely on the mistake that has been done before. 
Well, it does if you look uh, at Illumina sequencing. Um, so there are two frequently used platforms uh, that can do that. So this single molecule based readout, and they are based on very different concepts, which is pretty cool, I think. So we have uh, PacBio single molecule real time uh, sequencing, and we have Oxford Nanopore technology. <clears throat> Oxford Nanopore technology is not based on the incorporation of a base, so it's not based on sequencing by synthesis, but it's based on changes in electrical current when a read moves through a pore. So a read moves through a pore, and then the uh, difference of electrical current that is measured over that pore changes based on the sequence that actually moves through that. So all of those nucleotides, they have a uh, different, um, uh, they, they, they cause a different change in electrical current. And based on that electrical current, this differences in electrical current that are measured, you can actually read your sequence. Um, well, Oxford for technology is very well known for scalability. So you have very small sequencers uh, that can sequence, that generate not a lot of uh, bases, and you have huge ones. So Oxford for both are, has on the both sides has machines uh, that you can that you can use. So you have very small uh, machines that are very uh, that generate not a lot of bases, and you have huge ones like the Promethean that has, have the highest throughput in the field. Um, <clears throat> its accuracy is, is not huge. It is still not the same as Illumina sequencing. So it still makes quite a bit of errors, but still you're looking at 95, 97% accuracy. And that's, that's increasing more and more. Nowadays, they are claiming that they have a uh, base quality 20 protocols, which would mean uh, an accuracy of 99%. So still one out of 100 Basis, you make a mistake, um, but uh, still, it is uh, for a lot of applications that is accurate enough. Then, uh, pack bio sequencing that is based on base incorporation, uh, so very different from Oxford Nanopore technology and in a way a bit similar to Illumina sequencing. However, this base or incorporation occurs in a single molecule. So, what happens is they tried to amplify this signal coming from the base incorporation by having our template into very small wells that amplify the signal. They are called zero mode waveguides. And at the bottom of that zero mode waveguide, uh, there are <clears throat> there is polymerase attached and your sequence moves through that polymerase. And uh, well, you, you then just measure the signal that comes from the zero mode wave. Um, it works on circular molecules and it has quite some advantages, which I will explain later on. And the accuracy is about 90%. I think nowadays it's a bit higher, but still uh, definitely not comparable to Illumina sequencing if you have a single pass through that uh, zero mode wave pipe. However, what is possible with tech biosequencing is to generate high fire read. And then what you do is you uh, sequence that molecule not once, but multiple times. And because the, random, the errors are completely random, if you make a consensus out of all those sequences you generate from the same molecule, you can get actually a very high base quality, so a very high ac accuracy. So this is how it looks. So this is your fragment, relatively long usually that you want to sequence. Let's say it's uh, like uh, somewhere uh, 50 kilobases long, so 50,000 base pairs long, so much higher than Illumina fragments. Um, the, what's happened then is uh, adapters are uh, attached um, that actually make it possible to generate a circular molecule and a circular molecule moves through, through the polymerase that's at the bottom of the zero mode waveguide, and it just passes multiple times through that polymerase. And because you sequence it multiple times, you get uh, multiple readouts of the same fragment, and therefore you can combine those into one and have a very high accuracy there. At some point, the polymerase is exhausted, 
and then you have to stop sequencing. So therefore, if you want very long reads with that biosequencing, uh, you usually have only a few pass-throughs or maybe only one. If you, have, if you sequence shorter reads, then you get more pass-throughs and therefore higher accuracy. Well, for Oxford Nanopore technology, it doesn't really matter how long the reads are. And therefore, if you want ultra-long reads, um, Oxford Nanopore technology is most likely the uh, technology to choose. Okay, I think we're uh, at, almost at the end of the presentation. Doug, this question. Yeah, um, my question is, um, do the third generation, um, well, uh, the, uh, especially the nanopore, does it need an amplification step uh, in the preparation phase uh, before I do the actual sequencing? Not necessarily. Uh, the standard library prep requires a PCR amplification step. Um, but there are ways to circumvent it. You still require quite a bit of input material. So there are, um, so uh, for example, what you can do, so there are two library preparation methods that are frequently used. One is the um, direct RNA sequencing, where you really directly sequence RNA, not, so not tDNA. And so therefore there's also no amplification step in there. It can be very interesting interesting if you are interested in base modification because you can also pick those up with uh, Oxford nanopore technology so if you're interested in base modification of RNA molecules um, then uh, you can use that uh, method another method that is gaining popularity is that you actually use CRISPR to cut out a piece of the genome that can be basically any length that can be sequenced by Oxford nanopore technology and therefore not um, use PCR to do targeted sequencing, but actually use CRISPR-Cas to do targeted sequencing. And therefore you, get, you usually need quite a lot of input DNA, but you do not have any PCR uh, steps in there, which can be quite uh, interesting. If you uh, if you are worried about PCR bias of your alleles, for example, mm -hmm. how much input um, uh, nucleic acid do I need uh, for nanopore sequencing? Uh, just to give you like a raw size estimation of of the input required. Uh, yeah, that that changes uh, all the time. Uh, so, but so we we recently tested this CRISPR cas thing. And then you really need five microgram of, of genomic DNA. So that was that's really a lot. There are also low input um, library preps for Oxford nanopore technology, and then you go can go down to the nanograms. So uh, depends depends on the on the kit you you are aiming to use. Thanks. But if you use low input, obviously there are PCR steps. Yeah, of course. Very good. Yeah. So. This is just question, something that I mentioned in the presentation. So what kind of invention led to the ability to sequence those very long reads? Okay, I think most of you have answered. I'll stop. All right, so um, <clears throat> most of you are right. So uh, mostly answer differentiating between base and single molecule skill, and that's exactly the case. So while both ion torrent and Illumina sequencing depend on a PCR step of the same fragment to increase the signal um, intensity to be able to, to pick it up, um, single molecule sequencing or long read sequencing always singles uh, sequence a single molecule and because of that, uh, they are not limited in terms of read length. Uh, base incorporation that doesn't get exhausted, um, that is almost always the case if you look at sequencing by synthesis. So even for PEC bio sequencing, at some point, um, the polymerase gets exhausted and therefore uh, stops. Also, the pores for oxygenanopore technology at some point uh, get exhausted and they, you cannot use them anymore. So that's, that's kind of a limit, would be a limit for um, single molecule sequencing. PCR with uh, unlimited amplicon length, um, well, 
I think there is always a limit to uh, to PCR. Uh, so that's also not the correct answer. So the correct answer was differentiating between bases at a single molecule scale. Last question before break. Why are error rates for long read sequencing relatively high? Okay, I think most we have answered. Oh, we have a tie. So we have a tie between differentiating between nucleotide at a single molecule scale is challenging, and the longer sequences have a larger chance on PCR error. Um, so longer sequences have a larger chance on PCR error. Um, in a way, that is true. Uh, but uh, for many cases, or is that true? Not that is true, even actually. Um, <clears throat> so in many cases, that is not really uh, the limit, um, and that also does not cause these these lower accuracies. Uh, the lower accuracy is really about the readout of the basis, and that is challenging because if you get trying to have a signal of a single molecule, uh, that's super tiny, of course. So that is very challenging to do, to get this very tiny signal, to be able to pick it up and convert it into a base and to convert it into an ATC or a G. That's the most challenging part for long-read sequencing. 